Welcome back to the course in nuclear medicine physics. Today, we're going to look at some interesting advancements in PET imaging in recent times. One really interesting recent advancement is known as time of flight PET. Now, when two photons are emitted in PET, and you detect one at one scanner and one at the other scanner, you know that they were emitted somewhere along a line connecting those two scanners. Now, if we knew the difference in timing between one photon hitting one detector and one photon hitting the other detector, we would know exactly where they appeared on that line. It turns out that timing resolution in detectors has gotten so good recently that we can get a pretty good estimate of the timing between one photon hitting one detector and one photon hitting the other. Now this isn't perfect, so it doesn't tell us exactly where those photons came from, but it gives us an approximate region of where we might think they came from. This ultimately increases the resolution of PET scanners, meaning that when you take an image, it's less blurry than otherwise. All right, so there certainly have been significant advancements in the past um, two decades. Um, you know, when, when scanners started to be really, you know, to move towards EGO-based scanners, there have been significant advancements. Uh, so we're going to talk about some of those. Now, the BGO, people started using more and more LSO. So we talked about detector aspects, but in this talk, we will talk about especially four major frontiers that have happened. Time of flight PET imaging, moving from 2D to 3D PET data acquisition. Here, we don't mean imaging. The images have always been 3D. So when we say 2D versus 3D PET acquisition, we're talking about something totally different, not the dimensionality of the reconstructed images. In tomographic imaging, you do get 3D you know, volumetric images. So this is something different. Uh, multi-modality uh, imaging. Uh, so multi-modality imaging, for example, PET-CT, PET-MR, and longer axial field of view imaging, and we'll describe all of those in this lecture. So one of the major um, um, advancements in PET imaging, and I mentioned in a previous lecture, time of flight PET happened even before the major new push towards it. But some of those early scintillators that were, that were used they were not very sensitive. So people put those aside, they move towards BGO, and BGO doesn't have the kind of timing that allows you to time a flight pet, but LSO does. So what does time of flight mean? And we had a nice question about this uh, also uh, in the past, where technically if, if the photon, if, if the source of the event is not exactly at the center of the field of view, and is for example here, well, technically the photon A reaches this detector a bit faster than photon B, which we, uh, reaches this, this here. Um, so if you have really good timing resolution, why can't you just use those timing uh, information to know exactly where they even come from, or at least to narrow it down to an area where you will say, well, it's, you probably came from, not from somewhere along the entire line of response, but let's say an area around here. So maybe allowing you to narrow down your uncertainty about this entire thing to maybe a, a smaller distance. Um, so that's what time of flight actually does. If you're able to get better time resolution, you can narrow it down. Now, even if you cannot narrow it, narrow it down, it's fine because again, tomographic image reconstruction, even if you don't know where it came from, from along this line of response, when you're collecting around the patient, surrounding the patient with detectors, you're able to do tomographic image reconstruction and get better get, and get, get images. But when you do time of flight, because you're not, your uncertainty along this line of response goes uh, uh, down and you're able to, instead of back project along an entire line of response, you back project here, you end up propagating noise less, okay? Because you are having Poisson noise in your detectors and you're back projecting them and you're propagating noise. If you are back projecting only along this distance, you are getting reduced no noise levels. Um, and LSO, for example, has been able to achieve this. Now you may be thinking, well, shouldn't that improve the resolution too? I mean, if we know exactly where this event came from, we may not even need to do reconstruction anymore, tomographic reconstruction. If we know where this event is, we get superb resolution, no need for reconstruction. Anytime we detect you know, a pair of events, we'll know exactly where this event is, done. We just put it there. 
put it there, put it here, put it here, put it here, and that's going to give you an image. There's no need for a tomographic image reconstruction. But that's not exactly the case. And the, the reason is because um, the detectors that we're having right now, and this is year two, two, 2021, um, you know, the resolutions that we're getting, timing resolutions that we're getting of, our, of the order of hundreds of picoseconds. And that only allows you to narrow it down to order of centimeters, not like one or two millimeters. So this, this is actually determined by this formula that the uncertainty, the positional uncertainty is given by this. This is the speed of light and this is the timing uncertainty. Um, now you, you may be wondering where, why is there a factor of two here? Because isn't distance equals to speed times time? I want you guys to prove this on your own. Uh, we're dealing with two detectors here. And uh, the positional uh, uncertainty is actually given by this, including a factor of two. I would like you to prove this and convince yourself that there's a factor of two here. So let me ask you a question here. Given that formula, um, given that formula, which one is the answer here? Oops, there you go. If you have a coincidence timing window of 400 picoseconds, how much is the positioning uncertainty? Now remember speed of light is three times 10 to the eight uh, meters per second. A hint I will give you is if you believe that one of these answers is correct, which it is, there's too many zeros to deal with here, but don't, don't worry about the zeros. Just look at the core numbers. You've got a four here. C has a, I'm almost giving this away. C has a number three in it, three times 10 to the power of a whole bunch of zeros or uh, three, three with a whole bunch of zeros in front of it, three times 10 to the power of you know, eight. So what's the answer gonna be? Right, so, yeah, so that's right. So uh, um, exactly, so, so most people are getting it getting this right, that the answer is actually six centimeters. And you can, you can do this, uh, you know, just by typing it. I just gave you a clue to drop all the zeros and trust me that the order is gonna be in centimeters. Uh, but yeah, so three times 10 to the power of eight divided by two times 400 times 10 to the power of minus 12 gives you something in units of meters, you convert that to centimeters, it gives you six, right? So. So it's good to remember for every 100 picoseconds, you get 1.5 centimeters. So 400 picoseconds gives you six centimeters. So why did we do this exercise? The point is, and these are, this is the order of timing uh, window that we're having right now. You know, 200 is, you know, for example, one of the existing camera is, uh, scanners in the field right now. We're talking about centimeters. So we're not narrowing it down to like one millimeter or two millimeters. We still have to do reconstruction. We're not improving the resolution. We're not getting rid of the, we're not directly improving the resolution. We're not getting rid of um, image reconstruction, but we are propagating noise less. So yeah, so instead of back projecting, for example, like that, you know, with this kind of a thing, you would do that, but with newer, you know, cameras, where this has gone down to, for example, 200 picoseconds, then this is, we're looking at like uh, three centimeter uncertainty. Um, so this is an interesting uh, plot that was drawn uh, five years ago, sort of predicting the future, but it's not, ex you know, the, the future doesn't have to be predicted exactly, but the point and the concept is very, very good by my uh, colleague, uh, Habib Zaidi. And the, the idea is, okay, so the, uh, t uh, time of flight resolution has gotten better and better and better and better, right? And, you know, in 2021, where we are, this is actually a pretty good prediction because we're, we're having a camera right now that is around 200. Um, you know, in the future, could we go down to a place where the time of resolution is so small that you're getting two millimeters? So, so to get three millimeter resolution, you're going to need 20 picoseconds. To get two millimeter resolution, you're gonna need like 13, you know, picoseconds. Uh, so we're not, we're, we're, we're not there, right? 
uh, people are talking of, of the order of 100 picoseconds right now. Uh, and it's going to keep getting better and better. But are we going to get there? When are we going to get there? But the point is, now that we're here, we still have to do image reconstruction. And we're still not directly improving the resolution of the um, scanner, but we are propagating noise less. So existing time of flight does not improve res the resolution directly. It reduces propagation of noise, right? And it turns out, by the way, in, in iterative image reconstruction, it actually improves convergence of iterative image reconstruction because your so-called system matrix is becoming uh, less sparse. Sorry, uh, it's becoming more sparse. Okay, so so it's becoming um, and and as the system matrix becomes more and more sparse, you actually converge faster and faster. Okay, um, you have a lot more zeros now uh, in your either in your system matrix thanks to the fact that uh, you know that you know this event there's a lot of zeros happening here. You don't have to back project here, so it's becoming more sparse and therefore it's becoming faster convergence. So you're getting faster convergence. And so in the same number of iterations, you're gonna get better contrast, but the noise is not increasing as much. So for a similar number of iterations, one arrives at a higher contrast image without noise amplification. So it is an example of two images without time of flight and with time of flight where you see that the contrast and the standard optic value you're getting, and visually you see it too, right? You see, uh, it has converged better. You're getting uh, better looking images. So there's no question whatsoever that time of flight has contributed, is contributing to significantly improving images. You're getting better. There's studies showing that you get better detection. Um, you, you're getting a better image reconstruction. You, you know, you're getting faster convergence of the image reconstruction algorithm, better image quality, less propagation of noise. There's very interesting papers coming up, but there's almost no question what um, that time of flight is, is the way to go. And it is a it's fast, fantastic contribution. Um, so here's a number of questions that, that you can try to attempt to, uh, to answer. Um, here's also, let's move on to the concept of 2D versus 3D head acquisition. It used to be the case that between the slices, the axial, this is the axial direction, between the axial slices, people used to insert in a PET camera, uh, so-called septa. Remember in a gamma camera, how you have between all detectors, like you have these collimators, uh, but you do that for both in the axial directions and, right? So, so you're doing that both in this direction and that direction. In PET, they said, you know, transaxially we're fine in this direction, but here we're gonna insert septa. You might think, why would you do that? PET, you don't need that. PET will know, will know you will know where this event came from. You could just do, get rid of these septa, but people used to do that. And so each ring, we call this ring because there's a ring around the patient and then there's another ring and then there's another ring and then there's another ring. So each ring was separated by lead shielding called septa which prevented photons originating, uh, you know, uh, or going to this slice from also being detected in a different slice. Um, but you could get rid of them. Why not get rid of them? In PET, you have coincidence detection. If something is detected here and it's detected here, you will know, you can draw the angle. So you get improved sensitivity. Um, but, and this is the reason original people didn't do it because you, you, they did need greater storage because now you're getting more and more data, more computational demand. Originally people didn't know exactly how best to reconstruct truly 3D acquired data sets. Um, it also does lead to more scattering scatter events being detected and random coincidences. We will talk about these in detail in the future. So these were sort of challenges, but then with improved detectors, you know, faster detectors, better electronics, better image reconstruction algorithms that really modeled and corrected for these kinds of events, people really sort of naturally switched to 3D PET image. I remember the years where uh, people were wondering, is this really gonna work? Is this gonna work for you know, this application, that application? Uh, but it's, it's a very natural way to go because you are able, you have coincidence detection, you have electronic collimation. There is no need for physical collimation. There is no need for septa in between. So then the vendors really switched, have switched to 3D PET uh, image acquisition primarily. So this is just a depiction of the exact same thing that I mentioned to you, going from 2D PET acquisition to 3D PET acquisition. You can see that the sensitivity has increased significantly. 
Um, yeah. So, yeah, so exactly. So when, we have a question here, you know, when you use time of flight pet or when you do, for example, 3D pet acquisition, can you inject less activity? And that's exactly the point. If you're getting better images, well, either you keep the injected dose the same and you get better images or you keep the same image quality but inject the patient less or you acquire for a shorter duration of time. So these three things that play with each other, image quality, duration of scan, and injected radioactivity, if you have better reconstruction algorithm with better technology, you can get a better trade-off between these. And so you have more options of improving image quality and or shortening the scan duration and or injecting uh, smaller amounts of radioactivity. So here are some questions for you to, to, to look at. Um, nowadays, you know, PET imaging is, is, is happening uh, very commonly in, in, in the clinical, oncologic domain in a whole body sense. That's not the case for cardiovascular imaging or for brain imaging um, um, and certain other applications, but for oncology imaging, it's very commonly done that way. And what does that actually even mean? That, that means you know, a typical axial field of view of a PET scanner has been typically 15, 20, 25 centimeters covering, let's say that much, okay? So you cannot cover the whole body. So that's why you have multiple bed acquisitions six beds, seven beds, eight beds to cover, for example, you know, a large axial field of view. And that, from that, you can get, you know, an image that looks like this, and you can merge that, for example, with CT, if you like, and get other models. But the point is multi-bed imaging, whether you do step and shoot, like one bed, one bed, one bed, or continuous, you know, bed movement, you can cover, um, you can achieve your know, whole body image. Um, so that's one important trend. The other very, very important trend is PET-CT. Um, you know, in late 90s, 1990s, both SPECT and PET were combined with CT at a research level, and soon the value was recognized. The value was definitely recognized by the PET community very early. So from the year 2000 to the year 2003, the entire market went from 0% to 100% PET CT in a clinical domain. Everybody switched to uh, for a clinical imaging to PET CT. Uh, it was a massive, massive movement, right? And SPECT later on caught up, even though SPECT CT was actually done even before PET CT in research sense and uh, construction sense, but you know, in, in the sense of clinical construction of such cameras and routine usage, it, it, it took a while, but it's now finally being is here. Um, but yeah, the idea of, of a combined PET CT scanner that you can sort of, for example, see here is that you're registering anatomic image for, from CT and functional images uh, from PEG. So you're getting anatofunctional or anatometabolic imaging. I like this quotation structure without function is a corpse. Maybe like this one, uh, not to insult you know, conventional CT too much, or function without structure is a ghost. I guess not to insult. Uh, uh, conventional PET imaging too much, but putting these together, you're getting uh, an atometabolic or anatofunctional image. Um, and on top of that, not only do you get you know valuable images for diagnostic and clinical tasks, because looking at both of these images definitely adds value to just looking at one of them, and having PET and CT on the same camera on the same scanner is very important because if you were to just scan them on a different PET scanner, then uh, on a different day or even the same day on a different CT scanner, by the time you move the subject from this bed and you take, you know, they get off the bed, they go to another camera this day or another day, their organs have moved. Um, so registration, you know, becomes more challenging. Whereas if they're on the same bed and just being, there's just sliding between the CT and the PET uh, portions of the field of view, you're getting very natural alignment uh, that is happening. Um, and also, Importantly, the CT can be used for attenuation correction. Um, and we talked about attenuation correction in SPECT. It's, it's pretty much the same concept. Uh, you can do attenuation correction of the PET uh, using CT. Conventionally, it used to be done using you know, really low quality uh, transmission scan where you might have had, for example, a germanium source or a cesium source or what, what have you. And it would take a long time to do a whole body scan. 
whereas with CT, it takes only a few seconds. You get high quality images. So definitely using CT can reduce the duration of total whole body scanning because now you don't have to do this additional point source rotating around the patient or line source uh, rotating around the patient. Um, there were some artifacts that were introduced because CT can have metal implant artifacts, contrast media uh, enhancements that may confuse the uh, attenuation correction for PET, but those have been largely dealt with. There have been correction algorithms, and I know many of you here have heard about those. Some of you in this audience I know have even researched in this area um, to, to compensate for those you know, metal uh, artifacts, for example, that can happen in CT-based correction of PET images. So, so it's really taken off. And PET MR also showed up later on this scene. Um, there was initially a lot of excitement over it. The, uh, the excitement sort of came down, but there's belief that it's now gradually and slowly picking up again, and it's becoming a mature industry. Um, these scanners do tend to be more expensive, um, um, and people have been looking for killer applications for them to really take off, but there's tremendous value, for example, research-wise, and people are coming up with interesting clinical scenarios where this is going to be interesting. So you could do, do simultaneous or sequential, uh, back to back. There's been a lot of emphasis on simultaneous because now you could do functional, for example, MRI or, you know, a lot of different, or, you know, spectroscopy or different kinds of things um, at the same time as PET. So really interesting stuff. The, the challenge was PMTs uh, in a, a PET camera are affected by a magnetic field in simultaneous imaging. So people came up with alternative ways of dealing with that. Uh, a, a very popular approach has been to just get rid of PMTs and replace them with silicon photomultipliers. And in fact, these have been so good that even regular PET scanners, not just PET MR, but even PET CT scanners are now increasingly uh, switching from PMTs to silicon photomultipliers, which Carlos talked about in a prior lecture. Attenuation correction is definitely complicated with MR-based PET um, attenuation correction because the MRI signal is governed by proton density and relaxation mechanisms and has no direct correlation with tissue density, unlike CT. So, for example, seeing the bone is very challenging. Bone is a major attenuating uh, uh, material in the body, but typical MRI doesn't see the bone. So people have modified the signal, the, the, the sequences of MR to see the bone, or they've used, you know, ad advanced segmentation methods or template methods to compensate or to fill up those spaces and, you know, AI-based methods. So there's been a lot of research in this area. Um, and, you know, there's been, it, there's significant efforts in this front. And again, PET MR is, is being used, um, actively in research and also in some uh, clinical applications. And a final note is extending the axial field of view. This is a typical PET scanner where you've got 15, 20, maybe 25 centimeter field of view, axial field of view. But there was this really cool design and idea that after a decade of working really hard, uh, doctors Simon Cherry and Ramsey Battery of uh, UC Davis ended up getting significant funding to do it after years of pushing for it, and they got it. And um, of course, you may think this is going to make this really, really expensive, but then the avenues it opens up uh, is significant. So if you go from like something like this to something that's maybe two meter field of view, you get a factor of 40 increase in sensitivity. Well, that can improve your image quality significantly. Or you could do imaging in less than one minute instead of like 10 minutes or 15 minutes or you could significantly reduce injected dose and, and or, so all these th three things combined. And you can also naturally do dynamic whole body imaging because the whole body is being covered up. Uh, and so you can look at the evolution of the radio tracer over time. So here are just some examples. And United Imaging is a company that has taken their idea and, and has produced this right now in the market, uh, almost two meter field of view scanner. Look, this is a typical PET scan. One hour post injection. This is the kind of radioactivity that is, for example, right now we're having within this patient total. But look at, let's say, ten hours post injection. Back then, nobody thought you could get anything because you know this is too much decay. This is like f more than f five half lives, right? But they're getting very, very good images. And the beauty is now some of the organs are taking things up more, uh, so you can look at drug distribution more because you can inject very, very, very small amounts. Just imagine the potentials for pediatric applications, just one example. But there's many, many new 
avenues? Can you do breath hold pet? Can you ask a pa patient to just hold their breath, do like a, I don't know, a 20 second pet scan, 30 second pet scan, done. And people are really taking those applications very, very seriously. And here's an example on the dynamic whole body. Look at the timing resolution. Typically a PET scanner used to have a needed duration of, um, uh, you know, the typical temporal resolution of PET has been thought of usually of the order of minutes. Now we're going to the order of seconds. Okay, so look at, look at um, this kind of image and look at the timestamps here. Okay, injection has happened through the foot, it's going up, literally one second um, intervals, which is, which is amazing. And then the intervals are now becoming more like three second, four second, five second intervals of reconstruction. Each of these is a reconstruction. And then one minute intervals, and you sort of see the, how the radio tracer moves through the body and accumulates in different organs, etc. okay? So, so there's definitely, so th they had this really nice jump, you know, and then uh, there's other colleagues that have pursued uh, this kind of applications like at uh, uh, UPenn, a group of Dr. Joel Karp and others, other colleagues, fantastic colleagues that are pursuing this. So jumping from this kind of a range to that range, and now in between, now you've got vendor, you know, vendors, other vendors uh, coming up with things in between. People are thinking about, you know, half a meter. People are producing half a meter uh, scanners. And uh, so, so again, this has uh, introduced tremendous uh, activity and excitement in the field. Um, so a question is, can we do, okay, so these are amazing technology, but can we do quantitative PET? Can we achieve really uh, reliable quantitation in PET? Um, and the answer is yes. And to do that though, we need to do a whole range of data corrections in PET imaging, correcting for things such as randoms, for scattering, uh, for dead time, and things of the sort. So that is what we will talk about in our next lecture.